How many of you have experienced value stream maps before? Okay, a little bit. Okay, now then, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a model for a value stream map. They do differ between many organizations, they, they pick them up, but the concepts are broadly the same. So, a value stream map is again in part of, or is constructed as part of Learn About the Process. It is purely a device that enables us to be able to see and understand the process better. So when we come to learn to see what the process is doing, a value stream map is a way of demonstrating that, pretty much as a flowchart would be as well. And as you can actually see, it's part of our learn about the process element, and it's still a deeply embedded element of listen to the voice of the process. Listen to the voice of the process. Learn to see what the process is trying to tell us. So what is a value stream map? Right, it's, it is an end-to-end -end map of the activities almost like the process elements where you have within your SIPOC diagram. In fact, you can use the process elements from your SIPOC diagram as the initial construct for a value stream map. But we then we add some other things upon it, right? The value stream map, obviously what we want to try and do is we want to try to understand what are the customer's needs. We want to try and achieve business results efficiently. And there's a balance between both achieving what the customer wants and delivering effective business results. So the SIPOP, as I said, provides a summary for the process, its inputs and its outputs. The value stream map adds certain levels of data above that, data about wastes and inefficiencies, some key time measures, and how products or services move through the process. So we're going to have a quick look at how we do that. So the value stream map, we use a high level flow chart to actually give us a picture. So we have process step one, process step two, process step three. You can do that with your orbit process. You can show how that works. We add inventory triangles. The inventory triangle is a simple representation of how much stock is held prior to that processing step. Prior to it, okay? So we have 10 prior to this step, eight prior to this step, 15 prior to this step. And then in the info box, we can have any number of elements of info. And I'm going to explain the info that you might have now. Depending on the organization, the, the content of the info box does change. Right? Because of what do you want in the value map to make visible to you? So we first thing would be runtime. How much time the process ran to gather the data that you've got. So if it says, well, I made 32 units, how long did the process actually run to make those 32 units? Okay. Downtime in minutes. How long was the process stopped for, for whatever reason? How long was the process down for during that period? How long does it take to set up the process so that you can actually operate How many defects does the process make during that operating phase? How many defects would it make? What rework would you have? So how many things would you need to rework? What was the total process quantity? And then the cycle time in minutes. And you can add in other elements as well if it's going to be relevant to you. Okay, so they're the basics you get in the information box. One of the things that we have to do, now pull on this, we didn't talk about this in our learning review, we didn't talk about sampling. What's gonna be one of the key points when you actually come to generate the data for a value stream map, do you think? And think back to yesterday. What sample size to use? Yeah, what's a relevant sample size? And uh, we also talked about one other piece of data yesterday that we frequently use. What was the type of data that that we frequently use that actually may not be really helpful on its own. <clears throat> Think about it. Think about why do we have a control chart? What's what's the key theme of a control chart? It, it, is, it will be quantitative data, but one of the key things we just want to be wary of when we're getting sampled data, so cycle time, for example, what might be... Is it the representative of the whole process? 
Brilliant, okay. Is it just the average or is it representative of the whole process? And that's what we need to be looking for. So be mindful of when you're generating the data, what it's going to be about. So what we need to have is when we're creating a value stream map is to have a plan of the type of data we want and how we're going to go about generating it. Do we need 15 pieces of data, 20 pieces of data, 30 pieces of data? Are we looking for an average? Are we looking for the spread? What are we looking for from the data? We must have a plan for it. So what we need to make sure is that the data is appropriate to collect and that you have a, a method by which you can do it consistently, that the collection period, normally for a value stream map, a value stream map is a snapshot. It's a quick photograph of what's going on here. So it tends to be a relatively short period of time, maybe an hour, two hours, something like that. Not, not typically much more than that. Um, right? Improvement team members collect the data real time whilst observing and mapping the timing on the process. So what are some of the measures? Cycle time. Cycle time is the time it takes one specific process to move from the first activity to the last activity. That's cycle time. So within a process step. What's the time it takes from starting to finishing? What's going to be important when you actually generate cycle time? Again, just go back to the previous conversation. It took me on average two minutes to do this. That's probably important to know, but what might be more important? No, think about variation. Yeah, yeah. The spread of the results. So on average, it took me two minutes, but three took me one minute, and three took me three minutes. Well, actually, setting your value stream on an average means that you're going to be late in many cases. Does that make sense? So where would you set it? I think what you need to do, that's a very good point. You need to have the average, but you need to, and we'll use it when we come to look at work balancing. The knowledge you've got between the average of the process cycle time and its variance will come when we come to look at the actual load balancing element of it. Because if there's a high degree of variance in the process, you probably want a lower load balancing than one that's got no variation where you can actually get a higher load balancing. We'll look at that when we come to load balancing a little later on today. Okay? Exactly, exactly. Averages are really powerful things, but they only are becoming really useful when you understand some other elements of the data. Right? So, but using an average on its own might lead you a problem. So cycle time, the time it takes to complete the sub-steps of a process step before repeating them again. They will be constructed of some activity which is value adding. It really truly adds value to the, the product. And some where there's non-value added. And what we want to do when we come to map the process is look for the value added and non-value added. And you'd be amazed, certainly in offices, for example, typically the value adding aspects of many processes in, in offices can be as low as 2 or 3%. Most of the other stuff is moving stuff around. Right? It's not adding value to the actual work. Uh, it's a little bit higher in workshops. It tends to be about 25 30%. Right? But if you think about it, in a workshop where you're moving a piece of material, where you're moving a piece of... Uh, work from one station to another, that is not value adding. It doesn't add value to the process or to the product. Okay, so we have something which is called average cycle time. That's going to be something that we're going to be interested in. Now, all of these figures are in your, all these calculations are in your process manager towards the back. Okay, but here's something like an average cycle time. Now, to work out the average cycle time, what we really want to know is from the runtime, the total runtime, what was the unplanned downtime and the planned downtime? And that leaves us then with what was left for processing. So we have the processing time. Now the average cycle time is going to be the processing time, this area here, divided by the total number processed. We're taking out the downtime at this period in time. We're getting a clear picture as to when the process runs, how many can it make? That's what we're looking for, okay? And that gives us the average cycle time. Now, the average completion time is another um, metric for looking at it. And again, you will design some of these things yourself when you understand your particular process. But the average completion time 
It recognizes, for example, frequent and or significant downtime due to process setup or changeover. So for those organizations, for example, that have a production stream that maybe has a line of machines and they just keep on changing tools, or they have a call center that says, right, today we're doing marketing on product A and in the afternoon we're doing marketing on product B, there probably will be a setup time where people get the screens in place and all the things that they need to do specific for that process. So where we want to actually look at that, we want to find what is the average completion time for it. So we, we have a quick look at this, the place here. So we have a setup time, then each time the person runs the task or runs the process, there is a cycle time. And then we may have to stop again now to actually set up again. And we go again, where we get this. So the actual equation we want to have, this one here is, is the average cycle time, oh sorry, the average completion time is the average cycle time, that plus that plus that, plus the setup time and then the quantity between setups. And we'll have a little look at the mathematics behind that in a little while. So that's the, how we look at it. Now delay time, is the time a product or service takes from the completion of the last stage of the previous process step to the start of the next process step. And that will include queuing, right? So the time it takes, the time, the, the elapsed time from when it finished in this process step to the time it started in the next process step is delay time. And we want to have a, understand that, right? So it's the, it will include transport, queuing and waiting. So let's have a little look, time in queues. I don't know, this is called Little's Law. I don't know who Little was, but there we go. Right, so if we have a little look at this, right? We have a process that creates one part. We then have a process that creates the second part. And we have a process that creates the third part. So what is the queue time for that? What do you think the queue time is for that particular process, for that one? What's the queue time? So it's waited three minutes, right? It's waited three minutes. So the queue time is the number in the queue, which is the inventory. So whatever inventory you've got, right? That is effectively your queue, right? Times the actual completion time. So the queue time is three times one equals three in that particular calculation, all right? Another approach to data collection for the value stream mapping, and this actually I think is probably the, the, the one that I find to be the easiest to do, is what we call tagging, where we actually attach a label to a, 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 a physical piece of work that's moving through the process. If it's in a call center or something like that, it can be tagging the time when calls were picked up and put down. So you can tag times when they go, so you can actually start to get time values on them. If you're in a production environment, is you actually put a physical label on something and people write the time they started to do something as it goes through, or a piece of paper or a card that's following it to get real value data, okay? So a sample of items or transactions are identified and tagged. Each tagged item is launched into the process and tracked at every stage of the process. I mean, what we really want to be looking for is the overall start and finish times and the start and finish times of every activity between it, because that will give us a set of data. So we've got the cycle time, we'll have the delay time, and then we'll have also the total lead time of the process. So it can give you a lot of data. And when you're coming to work out your manning and your loading for workshops or for offices or for, um, for, for your, your task, understanding the cycle time, the delay time, and the total lead time become quite useful characteristics to understand. So let's look at cycle time tagging, right? So we write on the, the time it, the process starts and we write the time the process finishes, right? And then you can get that. Now the queue time, you write the time it enters the queue and you write the time that it starts Pressing on tag. So you, you write the time on the actual tag. Very straightforward technique. Now, control information is something else. Control information on a value stream map is the information that builds up. So we've got our process steps, we've got our information boxes, we've got our 
um, inventory. The question is, what is the control method that starts process one working? What is the means by which process one starts working? How does it normally happen in your world? How do process one know to start? Or is it, it's eight o'clock in the morning, the shift started, just start producing. Yeah? Yeah? So, would you all say you work in an environment where it says, it's eight o'clock in the morning, just start working? Right. Okay? If you work in that sort of environment, it's classically known as a push environment. It's a push environment. To get to a position of optimized production flow, we need to move it to a pull environment where the work actually starts when the work needs to start. And to get to that point, you need to have a higher degree of knowledge of the process and the steps within the process. You need to be able to understand a lot more about the process than if it's a simple push system. So ultimately, we want to try and get away from a push system to a pull system. And we're going to start to explore that with the value stream map, how we actually go about it. Right. So you might get daily production orders, for example. They're classic ways of saying, I want you to make five of these, three of these, two of these. Right. So it's a daily production order. So that's how the information gets down to the process to say, start work. Right. Now the lead time. Lead time is a composition of a sum of all of the cycle times plus all of the delay times. Right. When you're using averages, be careful when you're using averages because use the averages of lead time, sorry, cycle time, delay time, and add them up. And then you calculate the average lead time. Guarantee they won't be the same because it's averages. Right? So you need to have a way of making sure you can reconcile that. So when you come to do orbit, you will notice that the lead time isn't an adding up of all of the averages. Be really careful, okay, when you come to do it. So, lead time, and it's from here to here. So, lead time profile. So, we have a delay time plus the cycle time. So, delay time, cycle time, delay time, cycle time, and that's how the process steps get built in. We mark up our inventory, and we only take it as a snapshot, because inventory is volatile often during the day, it will move up and down, so any particular time. So we're only looking to say what were they at this point in time. You need to remember that it was a snapshot, it was only a snapshot and not what's in stock all of the time, right? And then we have our info box, right? What is the control information? How is it made? How does the instruction for work get made? So what I'm going to get you to do now then is to get back to